Hi, this is Chris Peters for the Hampton History Museum. And what's that? There's someone behind me. Ah. Ugh. Well, I don't think I really have to worry about him. That used to be Blackbeard, and we'll talk about him again in a few minutes. But first, let's take a few minutes to talk about piracy itself and how it affected the economy of colonial Virginia. Now, if you have ever watched a pirate film or read a pirate book, what's the number one thing that pirates are always after? It's going to be treasure, gold and silver, like the coins you see on the front of the table. Three and four hundred years ago, most of the currency that was in circulation in Europe and the American colonies was made out of precious metals. The coins were made out of solid gold, silver, or copper, and that meant that they were worth the weight of the metal itself meant that this currency was universal. No matter where it came from or where you had it, it was worth the weight of the metal itself. So pirates would have loved to get their hands on precious metals, on coins. However, in reality, that was extremely difficult. By the end of the 17th century, most European nations had adopted a, an economic policy that we refer to as mercantilism today. And one of the foundations of mercantilism is that precious metals were to be kept in the home country. What this means is basically that France, England, Spain, and all of the other countries of Europe were hoarding gold and silver at home, and they wanted raw materials to come out of their colonies and the colonists to be purchasing goods that they were making at home. That was the way they wanted the economy to work, and it meant that coins, like the ones you see on the table, were pretty rare on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. So we can take that one off the list. The one place that you might have found coins like this is on Spanish ships headed back from Mexico to Spain. Every year, Spain brought back dozens of ships full of gold and silver in quantities that we can't even imagine today. So there is wealth to be had. However, these are the most highly armed and most protected ships in the world at the time. And for a pirate to attack one, they would have to have a fleet of ships at their disposal, something that was very rarely available. So in the real world, coinage was out of reach of most pirates. Instead, they're going to have to attack merchant ships. And again, in the real world, this is a much easier task because those Spanish treasure ships aren't just full of gold and silver. They're also full of large cannons and lots and lots of sailors. Some of the largest ones had around six or 700 men on board. So it's gonna be a pretty hard target to take. On the other hand, a cargo ship is gonna be full of goods. And the idea is to sell those goods at a profit. The more people you're paying to be on that ship, the more that cuts into your profits. So merchant ships only had a handful of sailors on board, usually somewhere between one and two dozen. So given the option between a warship covered with cannons and full of hundreds of sailors versus a cargo ship that has a couple dozen sailors and is full of goods, only has a couple of cannons on board, which one's going to be the easier target? I'd go for the merchant ship. So let's take a look at the economy going back and forth between Virginia and England at the time. Now, the economy of colonial Virginia was focused mostly on agricultural products and natural resources. Tobacco was the foundation of that economy, along with stuff like wood, animal furs, and wood byproducts. So these things are coming out of Virginia. They really have no value here. So if a pirate captured a ship off the coast of Virginia full of these goods, they have to take that ship all the way to England. They have to deal with customs agents who are on the lookout for pirates and are going to be inspecting everybody's paperwork and get them to market there pretty dangerous perspective, but these goods are worth a lot of money. The other option is to capture a ship headed into the colonies full of household goods like the ones in the middle of the table. This is simple stuff like ceramic, glass, porcelain, metalwares like brass candlesticks, pewter plates, even tobacco pipes. These are the things that are being brought into Virginia. Now, they're not going to be as valuable by volume as the goods that are coming out of Virginia but you're a lot closer to the market. If you can bring these goods into Virginia and sell them on the black market here, you can make a quick buck off of that. Maybe not as much as you would make stealing precious metals 
or selling these goods on a European market, but this is going to be a lot easier. So given the choice between stealing raw materials and taking them to Europe, or stealing household goods and bringing them into the colonies, which one would you choose? For me, I think I'm going to go with the household goods, and that's what most pirates did too. Now, one of the other features of most pirate films is that you're going to see a lot of cannon fire. It makes for really good movies if you see lots of cannons blasting out of the side of the ships, lots of smoke, lots of noise. That's very flashy, and it's really impressive on the big screen. However, shooting a bunch of cannonballs through the side of a ship full of glass and ceramic, that's going to damage most of the products that you're trying to make money off of. So in the real world, most of the fighting was actually done with small arms like the ones you see on this end of the table. Pistols and muskets swords, and hand grenades. Now, the pistols and muskets are going to be single-shot weapons. After you fire it, you have to reload it, so it takes a while to reload. They're very effective weapons if you know how to use them, but they can be a little bit slow. Swords, axes, and other bladed weapons don't have to be reloaded, so they're very common, and they're a little bit different from most of the ones that you'd see in a movie. In most films, those pirate swords are going to be really long, really flashy, they're covered with gold and silver, and there were swords like that, but for the most part, they were going to be a lot shorter. The sword that I have on the table only has a two foot long blade on it, and this was a lot easier to use. Those really long swords that could be three and a half or even four feet long, it's going to be pretty hard to use that down inside the confines of a cargo ship with low overheads surrounded by cargo. A short sword or a large knife a lot easier to use. And then hand grenades. Most people would think hand grenades are a modern invention, but these have been around for hundreds of years. In fact, they have found examples dating all the way back to the late Crusades in the Middle East. So these have been around for hundreds of years. 300 years ago, most of the hand grenades were made out of cast iron, like the one that I'm holding. And just like modern grenades, they were filled with an explosive. In this case, it would have been black powder. So on a ship, you would light the fuse coming out of the top of this hand grenade, throw it onto the other ship, and then it's going to explode up on deck. This is going to kill and injure the sailors, and it's going to leave the cargo intact. So small arms like these are going to be much more useful when you're trying to capture a ship full of delicate household items like these. Now once the pirates capture the ship, they're going to bring it into the nearest port they, could, they think they can, they may still have to deal with customs officials and have paperwork, so if they go to the port where the ship was destined, that could be a problem. They may want to move a little bit further away, but it, still, they want to get to the nearest port they think they can and sell these goods on the black market. This is going to have a huge impact on the economy, especially if you're one of the merchants that imports these goods. Now, the farmers living in Virginia who grow the tobacco, they probably don't care. They want to get these goods at the cheapest rate they can, and if that means going to the black market, so be it. They want flatware on their table. They've got to pay for it. They want the cheapest goods they can get. But if you're one of the merchants that imports these goods, you really don't like pirates because they're affecting your bottom line. They are going to cost you lots of money every year with each ship that they capture. And so Piracy really affected the merchant companies that were bringing these goods into Virginia, and that means that it affected custom duties as well, and that brings governments into the issue. The farmers may not care about the black market, but the government does, because they want their cut as well. They can't pay for ships or soldiers or sailors. They can't deal with any of the functions that they do if they don't have tax revenue, and the duties paid on imports were a big part of that. So they've got to protect the income of the nation itself and the customs agents that collect it. So pirates like Blackbeard were affecting the bottom line for merchant companies and national governments, and that's why they were fought against by those national governments. Blackbeard was captured by a group of English sailors who were sent down to North Carolina specifically to track him down. Now, there's going to be another video that covers the story of Blackbeard's capture, but it is very relevant to Hampton's local history. So tune in for that video as well. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.